to welcome to the online technology meeting, Francesca. Do you know exactly this is one year, one year since I sent an email to the team saying we are totally crazy. We're organizing online technology meetings, several per week with 50 people in the room. Well, one year has gone by. Thank you very much for this. Let's start. Let's start the online technology meeting on LiDAR 2.1. You do not want to miss this one. Monday, 15th of March, we will talk about LiDAR and the new photonic developments needed for a smarter and safer world. In a two-hour discussion, we will identify business opportunities for the two most important application fields, automotive and geomapping. Number one, autonomous vehicles. LiDAR is meant to become the eyes of the self-driving car of the future. But for that to happen, we need further developments towards cost and size reduction while keeping the highest reliability standards demanded by the automotive industry. Pixels, SPADs, silicon photomultipliers, MEM scanning solutions are there to be evaluated. And at the forefront of innovation, FMCW LiDAR using photonic integrated circuits. Let's open up the discussion with Scantinel, Leather Tech or Velodyne together with the over 200 companies who have registered today. And linked to that, we see a huge push for LiDAR in industrial manufacturing. Let's confirm it by asking the epic question to ABB, RoboSense LiDAR or Javil. And how about avionics, automated airports or drones? Let's talk with Airbus. The second application field is agriculture, greener environments, and 3D mapping. LiDAR can be used to create 3D elevation maps to evaluate the fertility, including the need for water or hours of sun exposure on a particular terrain. Companies like Faro or Leica Geosystems are making a difference in that industry. Let's talk to them about the need of optics, lasers, and cameras in long-range applications. And linked to that is the possibility of underwater surveys using green wavelengths that can travel through water with minimal propagation loss. This can be done even from space, so let's ask the European Space Agency what they need from us. In that segment, the future is to go beyond mapping and perform environmental monitoring. The possibility of combining UV, visible and infrared wavelengths enables the possibility of detecting pollutant levels and particles of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide and methane, providing vital input in the planning of smart cities. Actually, before the digging starts, LiDAR is used by archaeologists and builders to understand what's under the ground surface. So let's empower photonics with LiDAR 2.1 for a smarter, safer world on March 15th at 3 p.m. Sign up early to participate in the Zoom room or watch live or later on the Epic YouTube channel. Join us and see what others can't yet see. So I asked you a couple of weeks ago to sign up and participate in the Zoom room and you listened to me and now we are all here looking, looking to do business. And as you can see, I'm having a lot of fun making these videos, but I'm also getting a lot of energies and feedback from the almost, almost 700 members. Francesca, we are only a couple of members away to announce. I'm going to put a sticker here with the number 700. I'm here talking on behalf of a fantastic team, a fantastic team of professionals, 15 people that really, really are making my life a dream. Thank you so much, my partners in crime. We, what we do here is very simple. We organize events, we provide access to the network. Basically, we introduce you to any particular partner, supplier, or customer that you want to have. We help you raise investment, and we never get a cent out of that. We have the biggest website to find a job in photonics, jobsinphotonics.com. Go and check it out. And we also provide everyone 
that is an Epic member with free access to a long list of market reports. And on that, that's why we have Tracy Vanik, our head of photonic market research, in the room. Today, we are, leading, we are heading towards the end of the third season of the online technology meetings. What a season it was. The topics for the fourth season are already announced, but I would like to bring your attention to the event that we have on Wednesday of Freeform Optics. It has an outstanding agenda and also 100 plus companies registered. It's going to be fantastic. And also for those of you who still don't know, this year, 2021, for the first time, Epic is supporting the quantum industry. And actually, next week, we have an amazing meeting on next generation transport and immobility using quantum technologies. For those of you who are looking at quantum and single photon LiDAR, for example, this is a great meeting to be placed in your agenda technologies to five to 10 years time to market. But today, today we are talking technologies to the market today and maximum to three years. LiDAR 2.1. First of all, I would like to acknowledge our media partners, Photonics Views, Electro Optics, and Asso Optics. Thank you so much for the great support that you do to us. But most important, let me take a breath of air. This meeting wouldn't be possible without the support of four sponsors today. First of all, Accetris. We go all the way to Switzerland. We've got the best micro optics we can find. But we can also go to Israel and get Actar. Actar provides black coatings, high absorption coatings for the black optics. But we can also go to Munich and get laser components. Laser components is the main provider of any photonic components from laser to optics, everything. 50% of the products manufactured themselves, everything supporting the laser industry. But we can also go to Bessi. You're looking for for semicon-like equipment for the assembly and packaging of photonic devices, especially diode, direct diode bonding. But if you are looking for specialty fibers, OFS should be your partner. They provide, of course, telecom fiber, but also they have a high-end development on fiber for automotive. But if you are looking for a complete line of instrumentation, including power meters, energy meeting, brain profilers, your partner is MKS or FIR. But if you go all the way to Sweden, NI4, thank you very much for being all of my players on the specialty fiber manufacturing. You, know, you need a microstructure fiber, you go to NI Force, but you need a semiconductor laser. Then you go to Finland and you talk to Modulite, specializing the whole MBE growth of the material, all the way to develop the full uh, package lasers, even to clinicians, but they have a really long range of laser solutions for LiDAR industry. And you're looking for solutions to the LiDAR industry, then slide all the way from Singapore, the design and manufacture, the FBs, Fabri Peros, Superluminescent diets, narrow line with lasers, H meeting LEDs, indium phosphide, and gallium arsenide. Thank you very much for sponsoring this meeting. And most important, Dr. Francesca Moglia. How did you do this? 200 companies registered. What's in the menu today? Thanks a lot, Jose, for the introduction. Yes, so you are many. I guess you are seeing each other, or maybe some of you not yet, but it, just to give you an idea of how really the full spectrum is, we maybe move exactly to these slides where we all need glasses. So those who don't have glasses, I'm sorry for you. Today, you are too many. No, you're never too many, but it's really nice that there was so much uh, interest on this event. Uh, we have the usual division, like as you see it, and users are there top in the corner. So that's, of course, very important to know. We want to hear their expectation on LiDAR and what is also actually that now they have and maybe in the future. That's why the 2.1. So we are looking a bit also to the future today. So then we, there is the automotive tier one suppliers in the very middle. So they are also, of course, on our radar to understand what they are needing now from the supplier chain. And as you see, yes, a lot, a lot of supply chain. So we have uh, PICS, of course, micro optics, optics and beam shaping, manufacturing services, the lasers, the materials, the coatings, and so much really going on today. So I don't steal you more time because we want to listen uh, of many wish lists today. So let's give the time and the, the real uh, to the real speakers today and to the real uh, protagonists today. But first, back to Jose. Grazie mille, Francesca. You did a fantastic, fantastic job today. Thank you so much. Two things about this slide. The first one, if you are an Epic member and you're missing your logo on this slide, that only means that you did not register to the meeting. This slide is only the graphical representation of the companies who register today. And also, for as long as I'm in the city of Epic, the Epic staff will know the technology of each member individually. 
And this is also a very important read of this slide. You know what? This meeting is about getting us to know each other. And I love that. So when the meeting finishes, we are trying, not really for the first time because we tried last Friday, but we are all going to go to the Wonder Me app. Most, most of you were at Photonics Plus and you know how fantastic this is. We are all going to use it to get to know each other. But most important also is that this meeting is live streamed in YouTube. So hello, YouTubers of the world. Welcome to the meeting. If you have any question during the meeting, please post it in the, in the chat and I will read it in the room. If you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, all you have to do is send me an email, jose.foto at epic-asoc.com, and I will be more than happy to make the introduction. This, of course, also valid for the people in the Zoom room. If you want to get in touch with each other, please use the internal chat, the private chat, and do business. This is what it's all about. But of course, if you want to get in touch with a particular company that you didn't have a chance to talk during the meeting, all you have to do is send me an email, and I will be more than, sure, I will be more than happy to make the introduction. Let's start the show, Francesca. I can't wait. We have to start with one of the key companies in this ecosystem. We have to start with Valeo. And for that, we have Thorsten Both, the Valeo expert and engineer for LiDAR technologies. Thorsten, thank you so much for taking the chance of opening the show today. The floor and the attention of everyone, 200 people watching, and I think about 100 people in YouTube, goes to you. Thank you very much. Are you able to hear me? Loud and clear. Ah, thank you. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm happy to <laughs> to be first stepper here, and uh, I'm I'm also proud to to show a bit of what what I was working on last uh, few months and years. Um, I I would now share my screen if that's fine for me. With yes, you. please go ahead. Okay. Remember that you have done a great job, but this meeting is about finding you collaborations. All we want to do is to find how we can help you, how help Valeo being even greater than already is. That's, that's the goal, indeed. So, um, hi, uh, my name is Thorsten Boyd. I'm a Valeo expert for LiDAR technology. And uh, today I would like to share some experience about uh, our new field LiDAR that we uh, put into a product uh, this year. And uh, you're probably kind of shocked because uh, you probably know the layout uh, of our long range slider, which is uh, the Scala. And yes, uh, since 2016, we are uh, the only uh, manufacturer of um, large scaling uh, la um, laser scanners. Uh, we, we are in... Um, business and this year, 2021, we also go into business with the second generation. Um, we are delivering to OEMs and we are quite happy with that. However, we uh, built a new product in our portfolio, which is the Neofit lighter because we saw some issues with our long range lighter that is for very specific use cases. Um, we have the issue of living with a restricted vertical field of view. And this restricted vertical field of view um, gives us no possibility to see what's up and down our view, of course. So um, we basically added now a close range LIDAR, the near field LIDAR, as we call it. And uh, this one is using a sun resistant AMCW technology with a high vertical field of view. So. What does that mean for an integrational part? Well, if you think of, if you if you want to use it, uh, if you want to use a car basically as a level two plus um, uh, ASL uh, um, autonomous driving vehicle, fair. You just need a long range lighter probably. However, if you go into level three, level four, you probably need additional information. Um, adding some start clearance into this. And um, we see that this additional information can be best given for such close range lighters. Um, so for example, here we added these as, as uh, options, but also we see the possibility to add these to other vehicles like semi-trucks or robotaxis or even droids. And um, the benefits here are probably shown <laughs> by raw data um, video, which is 
an early stage video of last year January. Actually, I don't I, I don't want to disclose all the benefits that we had so far in, in progressing with it. But as you can see here very clearly, we are able to see with our LiDAR a ball in the hand of a person. <laughs> we can distinguish that very easily and track this, which is amazing for, I think, for, for any kind of LiDAR technology to be able to, to distinguish this. And uh, to, to come to this, we, we have uh, the NFL with the certain specification. Here you can see it's a 940 nanometer center wavelength. Uh, we can right now see up to nine meters at 10% um, reflectance. However, I think in future we will come further. We have a maximum range due to several operation methods to up to 150 meters with a resolution of order of four degrees in each direction. Uh, we have an FPS of around 80 Hertz, also depending a bit on the operation mode. Um, I think most customers are heavy, uh, happy with 15 or 20 Hertz. And our vertical field of view is horizontal 100 degree to vertical 80 degree. Where we are very proud is that our vertical, uh, our field of view coverage is 100%. And that is quite different to what you might see otherwise on the market because um, you would see some scan patterns. And those scan patterns um, by, by spot scanning or something, you would have a vertical field of coverage of maybe 30, maybe 40%. And um, basically with this sensor, you won't miss a thing <laughs> on the street. Uh, this is how the NFL looks. We have a sending path this way and a receiving path this way. The sending path starts with the Vixel. Coincidentally, I was on my first EPIC conference on a Vixel conference in Stuttgart. Um, and then we went uh, here with the Vixel through a lens holder, which has a diff diffuser beam shaper combination. Uh, up to the front cover on the receiver side. Um, we have then just a receiver window, a barrel, and here our receiver chip. Uh, and since we want to have as much information as we think is needed uh, in, the, in the horizontal point of view, uh, we put most of our, our illumination there. So we don't expect to... <laughs> To look nine meter to the ground, we have um, different distributions of illumination, and that is actually a pattern pending here. Uh, so one possibility to see where this might be used in cases where we don't have, you know, Valeus traditionally an automotive supplier, but where we don't have a, a, a person, personal car uh, situation is, for example, in trucks. We have a rear assistance looking to the back. We have turning assistance on the side. We might have a classical front assistance where you can see, um, for example, start clearance. And these assistant sensors would help, for example, in such a case here where you have very um, dense truck densities uh, on logistic centers and you try to maneuver into one of the um, supplying areas here. So in our opinion, however, each of these assistance um, or assistance sensors would have to be designed with a very specific field of view. So if you come to us and say, hey, we have this particular use cases in mind for your sensor, we will specifically design um, our illumination pattern to your case because for a truck, a truck is usually uh, longer than nine meters. So we would try to get here uh, the 10 or 50 meters. So if you're now interested to work with us um, from a component manufacturing side, well, if you have pixels that are interesting, if you have beam shapers, if you're if you're saying we are professionals on receiver optics or even have a, a very specific receiver, um, please contact me. Um, I'm, I'm here also for screening uh, new technology developments and uh, I, I will uh, get in touch with you. On the other side, if you are a 
potential customer of Valeo, um, having droids, having cars, having trucks, and you say, hey, that's interesting. We would like, we would like to have some, um, some information about this. How is that? We would like to gain experience. That's very easy. We are selling these uh, sensors here as a mobility kit with plug and play possibility. And uh, you can contact here via this email address and, and get an inquiry. So with this, I would like to thank <laughs> all the audience and uh, I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thorsten. You didn't hear me, but I thank you twice, believe me. <laughs> the first time was only for myself. <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us today and for having a nice wish list that, of course, we cannot. Uh, so can you maybe we show it again or I have it in mind? So big cells, beam shapers and the receivers and receivers optics, right? Yeah, there it is. So there is someone in the room that I believe can definitely support you with this and, uh, and, uh, and also maybe comment if they are so shy that they want to. I have Simon that has a, ah, okay. So, uh, okay, so Gregory, you can ask the questions. I see it in the chat, <laughs> please, from Ficon Tech. Um, hello, Torsten, thank you very much for your talk. Um, um, yes, my, my, my speaker's on, good. Um, uh, you say you're looking for component suppliers. Um, what about manufacturer subsystems for your for your modules? How do you manufacture? Is this something that you would be interested in, interested in? So you're you're. Do you mean the the PCBs the, or or what do you mean the, by subsystems? the optoelectronic subsystems that you use in the modules? How do you do the alignment with the the pixels to the, through the optics? Well, um, if you. So we usually, if you if you have a, a suggestion of how we can um, put you into our manufacturing uh, process, I'm fine with that. Um, however, um, one of the key <laughs> key uh, roles that we are playing is that we like to to build and manufacturing most. But ev what, however. We, we always do a buy or make a decision. So if you if you want to be part of this buy or make decision, um, please contact me and- Okay, will do, thank you. And yeah, thank you. Very good. Then I know that Simon has a, a, a politically incorrect <laughs> question, but uh, Simon, if you can reformulate it in the best way <laughs> to ask this question to Thorsten, we can accept it. <laughs> of course. I mean, uh, Thorsten, first of all, very interesting talk. Thank you for, for sharing your insights. Uh, the question is, uh, there's always a, a price pressure on automotive LiDAR, especially for the long range, so to say. Um, uh, you are addressing uh, near field LiDARs uh, is this reflected also in, in uh, uh, cost scenarios or how do you how do you play with that or is it the same challenge uh, you're facing here well um, since since um, Valeo is an automotive supplier we are always price pressured and um, it it always comes back to to um, how many uh, you want do you want one well that will be much more costly than when you want one million of them. So uh, it, it it highly depends on on um, on your um, volume. If if you, however, um, we want to we want to break here the price. I mean, if you if you build these sensors for droids, yeah, and you want to 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 use them, it's not the same price sensitivity than you have for basically. Uh, cars or trucks so depending on what you actually want to see may, maybe the, the the illumination is is not necessarily that high for for that range purposes or whatever so you might need um lower budget on performance and that will reflect itself so this is why i say we have to be very sure that we understand the use cases and um from the use cases, we can also try to tackle different price points. Um, I'm pretty sure of that. Well, thank you. 
Very good. So thanks a lot. It was a very, reform very good reformulation, Simon. We appreciate, <laughs> we appreciate that. <laughs> so now it's time for Winfried from Lisa Components. You raise your hand, right? Please, you can ask your question. And you're muted. You're muted, Winfried. <laughs> okay, but you can hear me now. Right? Now, yes. <laughs> and Thorsten, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, you mentioned that you are achieving nine meters at the moment with the flash lighter. Uh, what, what is the power level of the pixel you have now to get these nine meters and how much power you will need, you think you will get to get the 15 meters? And the power is limited because the answer? or 15. I think you mentioned, I um, think you are getting nine meters at the moment, correct? Yeah, so you, you want to, to have 15 meters. Uh, you mentioned you want to get 15. At How much power do you 15. have at the moment for the nine meters already? And uh, so basically, um, well, it, it, it depends a bit on how you design it and what, again, the actual use case is. But I guess that um, there is the same, um, same way of, of coping with this uh, as a long range lighter. You have a square root. Um, dependency on, on power. And then you probably have uh, clever engineers that uh, overcome this design <laughs> in, in a way. Um, so if you double it, um, you're, you're 1.4 times uh, further in range, more or less. And uh, then if you, if you want 50 meters, you would have to go on 2.5 times or, or so um, the, the actual uh, power that we are using right now. Um, this actual power? That is something I don't want to disclose. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, we start with the we get it, we are getting to the secrets, so we are getting to get Thorsten <laughs> to the limit, but that's enough because then we can speak offline on the details. So that's very good. So now we have another question, and many now people are starting to get excited. So now it's time for sorry nano system, Michael. You can ask your question you wrote in the chat about the sun resistance. Do you hear me? Yeah, exactly. Now, um, very, very good. Yeah, there you go. Uh, hey, Thorsten, uh, you mentioned on one slide that uh, this is a sun resistant AMCV lighter, right? So how did you make it? Can you explain a bit more about this? Um, yes, so we are using a receiver technology um, that was supplied to us and um, that technology is basically canceling out um, background light, um, continuous wave light. And um, this, which, which supplier we have and, and what um, AMCW technology we are using, I also don't want to disclose, but um, overall we basically have, if we, if we have um, from our experience, basically no dependency on sun illumination. Very good. So now we have also a, another question from Simon, another Simon from Limo. Yes, it's correct. Yeah, so, there you go. <laughs> good, you can hear me. So my question is, is there a demand for higher angles than 100 degree or is it just now, uh, yeah, that that it's limited by the technology that you are using, by the material that you are using for the diffuser? So what I would find very fancy on receiver and sending side is if you can build me something that has 180 degrees or more. 160. Um, hmm? 160 would be possible. 160. Hey, I'm I'm 160 is close to 180. So uh, um, it's just 20, you know, difference. That <laughs> that is great. <laughs> this is motivational, you know. It's like on the on the auction, who offers more? Yeah, I, I, I learned to say uh, not no. <laughs> no, no. Never say no. Always say push it a little more, and they are here yeah. just to listen to this. So that's yeah. very good. You are you happy, Simon? <laughs> You can almost deal with it, right? <laughs> no, I'm I'm fine. So um, if you if you have higher vertical fields of view and and are able to to uh, to supply 
these components to us with the quality and uh, that is also important not not like uh, our competitors with like hey uh, we we just do it once and that's fine but i with the with the um with the quality that you can supply on 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 thousands of samples that is something we are interested in if you're if you're a small niche uh, industry partner uh, where you can say we can build 10 of these pieces we have our issues with that let's let's put it that way but um no we are producing on, on million levels so yeah i will well, we will reach out to you um, that sounds like the good plan Exactly. I believe that Limo can offer a couple more than, right? Yes, <laughs> That's <definitely>. good. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Now, if I remember correctly, Heiko from Continental, raise his hand. Um, Heiko, do yeah, you hear yeah, us? Hello. There you go. Yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can All hear right, you. Great. Uh, I'll see you. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, great uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Well received. From Torsten, from, from competitor com to competitor, um, I did um, AMCV LiDAR since, I don't know, more than 20 years now. Um, and um, I have, well, I went to many, many uh, valleys of tears with this, in, in, in particular in um, environmental sensing, in, in challenging environmental situations, and that's exactly where you also want to apply the sensor. Um, and also many of our competitors have um, failed terribly bringing this to, to market. Why do you think you got it right this time? That's a great question. Um, probably because we are um, having a lot of experience of our scent lighters that we already have in the market. Each generation that was developed, I personally had some uh, some uh, experience with, and um, from this, we um, are able to put our lessons learned into new technology, uh, and with the right people and the right mindset. And if you know the problems ahead, I think you can cope differently than um, doing. Uh, a fast learning process, and uh, you can you can also um, get into into the you can get into issues. You, you can also set teams into issues which you already know that will exist. Yeah, you can test already for certain problems that that you know that will be there. And um, for example, people are asking for, for this AMCW, why, why is it sun resistant? Well, we know that if it's not sun resistant, it won't fly. So we picked something that is. And uh, for, for that regard, we uh, use also technology that has uh, other um, possibilities that, that would probably people that come now from university would not know about. And this is why why we we uh, go very fast and very very uh, very strong ahead with our technology. Thursday, ding ding ding. Question from YouTube. Uh, YouTube Universe is also watching you right now. Jan Vermeeren from the company Kaleste wonders about the data that is actually coming out of the unit for the integration of your lidar. Are we talking about point clouds or are we talking about shapes? What is the information that you give to the system in integrator? So right now we are uh, we are delivering um, just raw data. Um, however, I guess if if there's interested in object recognition, we we can do that. All right. Furthermore, I was I loved I loved the final slide. That was really truly fascinating. Let me bring it back. I loved it. Uh, one of the things that you should show us here is that you are looking for shapers, optics, receivers, and pixels. And pixels have had a interesting way of entering the LiDAR market. I would like to discuss this quickly because we have in the room one of the market leaders worldwide on Vixel manufacturing. We have in the room AMS, Duke Nguyen. How are you this afternoon? 
one, two, three, Duke, and going from AMS. You are muted. That's the usual. Good afternoon. <laughs> All right, Duke, we have been discussing with EMS in plenty of meetings about the big sales for the automotive industry. What is the current state of the art and what could you do to help Valeo? Yeah, actually, uh, we had some conversation already with uh, Valeo uh, for this project. Um, and the state of the art now is the multiple stacks where we're going up to five and we are uh, trying to break that. So for that, you will have higher slope efficiency and in the end, the system efficiency to, to crank out more power. And then in the end, the range, yeah. Are we talking about pixels already being the laser source of choice for miniaturized LiDAR or are we not there yet? Um, th there are lots of system solutions or system architectures out there in the markets. You, you know, there are more than hundred players doing their own system and all of them believe they have the best solution. Um, and we have um, Vixel against Etchometer, against Fiber Laser, integrated laser as well. Um, but with AMS and OSRAM, we have um, both Vixel and Etchometer currently. So we believe we are an unavoidable um, customer for developing your LiDAR system. Thorsten, if I could give you the best Vixel in the world, your Santa Claus Christmas list of Vixels. Thorsten, could you give us a bit of a spec, something, or maybe you can discuss this offline if you are not comfortable. Yeah, I would I would rather discuss Thursday. this offline because yes, it of really course, depends do. on the specs. Yeah. <laughs> Thorsten, what would be your ideal Vixel? If you could say a few like specs on efficiency, wavelength, operation. I... I'm not so bound on wavelength, I would say. Um, but I would I would say that something that I would I would love is a high efficiency um, with with um, you know keeping cool. I like I like things and people keeping cool, and and that is something I would like to see for our technology ahead. I love the comment of Greg Fling from Ficon Tech in the room. He says, you, what you want is tested, qualified pixels. And that's exactly the answer. Thank you so much, Greg. But I also want to talk to you about the bean shapers. Uh, you talk about bean shapers being a need that the Epic Network can provide you with. I don't know if you know that we actually have organized lots of meetings on bean shaping. And one of the companies that is leading the way is Skylabs. Arno Rigny from Skylabs. Are you in the room with us and unmuted? Uh, yes, I think you should Fantastic. be Fantastic. How can you hand. help? How can you help Valeo? Well, um, I think that uh, our technology is really able to uh, really shape exactly the kind of custom shape you would like or you would need. Uh, I don't know exactly what are your constraints or what kind of improvement are you looking at, but probably there is some... Uh, uh, some things that we can bring to you. On it that. is very miniaturized. As you can see in the slide that we can see here, uh, bean shaping would be really in the inner sender optics module. So we are talking about something the size of four times a die to play, a dice to play dicing. So what could be something that we can do for integrated, integrated bean shaping solutions? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, we could integrate something in, in, in that kind of uh, in that kind of size. But um, the question is more about improvement of the shape uh, that we can uh, add to your system. And so, if you are looking at, uh, I don't know, something more flat, more uniform, you know, or with a specific shape, I don't know, then it could be worth uh, discussing it. Thursday, you're going to be introduced to many companies doing bean shaping. We had the specs clear. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having the support of Valeo. And now we're going to move on with the program. For many years, I have gone to OFC and Photonics West. And one of the key presentations I always see, the presentation from Robert Bloom. Robert Bloom can speak about silicon photonics for 400G plus transceivers and for LiDAR. Today, today he's going to talk about LiDAR. Robert Bloom is from Intel, General Manager of Intel Silicon Photonics. Robert, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to Epic member Intel to talk about LiDAR. The floor is yours. Jose, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, you can see all the slides. Everything is good. Crystal clear, yes. Perfect, perfect. So let me remind you what we're doing here at Intel uh, in, in, in the division that I'm part of, the silicon photonics division. 
obviously, it's been a really great journey over the last uh, four to five years, uh, scaling silicon photonics really to high volume manufacturing after a long, long period of research. And it's really all about making optics, manufacturing optics at silicon scale using 300 millimeter CMOS manufacturing, um, doing wafer level testing, um, high speed testing, not, not just of the electrical properties, but also of the optical properties, uh, and then also doing wafer level burning. And as some of you might know, what's unique about our approach is that we're not just doing the, the passive components in, in silicon, but we're able to, uh, to add gain to add indium uh, phosphide compounds onto the silicon platform so that we now can make lasers, we can make semiconductor optical amplifiers, photodiodes, uh, not just in germanium or silicon, but also in indium phosphide. Uh, and that's really key uh, for, um, for LIDAR uh, as we're gonna be um, talking about in, in a few slides. So to, I'm sorry, this is going slow. To uh, Jose to just show you one transceiver at least, right? This is uh, this was one of the products that we have been shipping into data centers really in high volume. We have shipped more than 4 million of these units and uh, they're really uh, they're quite successful where uh, this, this is all non-hermetic. So we, you know, we're replacing traditional optics that's using discrete lasers, modulators, discrete uh, multiplexers. We're replacing all of that with a single silicon photonic chip that doesn't need to be in a hermetic package. Um, and uh, really what is quite extraordinary about these modules is that, that they have really industry leading uh, quality and reliability. The lasers themselves have the failure rate of, of around two. So two failures per a billion device hours. The whole entire module has a DPPM of 30. So this is really uh, industry leading uh, and shows really the benefits of integrating everything in, uh, in silicon photonics. And then, um, you know, so when we, when we looked at our, our, our portfolio of our components, we have all these, not just these passive devices, and this is just a small uh, subset, obviously, of all the different devices we can do in photonics, but all of these active devices that we can now take and integrate onto, onto a single chip, right? And so obviously up to, to date, the focus had been on data centers, but now we're really expanding into these new applications. And uh, as, as you will see, LiDAR is really a, FMCW LiDAR in particular is really a prime um, uh, example of, uh, of, um, of where we can use this technology because we need a lot of components integrated on a single chip. But let me show you the, the, one of the key parts also that is uh, uh, really very relevant for LiDAR because in LiDAR you have to go free space. And now you're not talking just uh, single milliwatts, you need to have high output power to go into free space. And so, the ability to actually take, take light and amplify it on chip and then emit it out of the silicon photonics chip is, uh, is quite unique here. And, um, in the, and then so maybe on the, on, the, on, the, on the bottom left, what you see is the you know, light coming in the silicon waveguide. We then have an adiabatic taper that uh, brings the light that pulls the mode into the indium phosphide. We can amplify it there and then it goes back into the, uh, into the silicon waveguide where it then can go out through an, an edge coupler, for example, or through a vertical uh, coupler. And if you look at the, the graph on the top right, you see uh, it's a little bit of a complicated plot. It shows gain versus output power. And uh, I would like you to focus on the red curve, which is sort of the nominal uh, operating current. And you can see that at uh, 20 dB of output power, which is 100 milliwatt, we get uh, 10 dB of gain. So that means if we have 10, 10 milliwatts in the waveguide, we can get 100 milliwatt out of the waveguide. And uh, if you go, for example, to the 17 dBm uh, point on the red one, so that's, this is 50 milliwatts out, we actually have 25 dB of gain. So that's just a, a couple of hundred uh, microwatts. Those can get amplified very significantly to give you really high output power on the chip. So we talked about that uh, a year ago, that this is really a key enabler for us uh, for LiDAR. And then, uh, then Mobileye, uh, our, our customer for the LiDAR that we're developing within, within uh, our group and also a, a different group within Intel, um, they talked about it at CES and, and showcased uh, basically the, uh, the, the LiDAR chip that, uh, that goes into the LiDAR module. And it's quite an astonishing chip. If you actually count all the components on, and, and subcomponents on the chip, you have, we have more than 6,000 uh, uh, both active and passive components that are integrated onto, onto a single chip. That, uh, that we're using to, to make this FMCW uh, LiDAR. And obviously um, it is really the next generation uh, LiDAR technology. We see a lot of benefits compared to uh, time of flight, um, not just around, uh, not just around uh, range, improved range, 
but also obviously the uh, the ability to uh, to detect velocity. Uh, I mean, you you could detect some kind of velocity with time of flight, but really it's it's almost prohibitive. Um, so we have the ability to detect velocity at, with the same uh, measurement. Uh, we're much more robust to uh, to interference. And because we're able to integrate it uh, in the photonic chip, also we see quite some significant uh, cost advantages over, over other technologies, right? So it's a very, uh, very strong value proposition. Um, so if you, again, compare uh, time of flight compared to FMCW, uh, the, the ability to really um, have single points that, that give you the velocity of objects, especially at a long distance is key going up to um, you know, 300 meters because of the coherent detection really you have a much more advantageous decay with, with distance of your, of your signal, of, of your signal or, or degradation of your signal to noise. And then the sensitivity uh, or the, I should say the immunity to interferences because you're only looking at your own signal because of the coherent detection is really a, a, big, a big advantage when you look at um, many, uh, many use cases, including retrorefactors or uh, or for example, going looking in, into the sun and 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 uh, or even other lidars. So that's a that's a strong advantage. And then also, if you look at points per second, um, you know we're able to do uh, two million points per second. So again, this is a, a very high sampling rate that 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 is able, that we're able to do with um, with our technology. So you know I only had a few minutes, so I'm trying to stick with that with the time constraint that Francesca uh, imposed upon me, but. I wanted to just leave you with the fact that really we have ramped ceiling photonics to high volume. It's a very mature, highly reliable and proven technology. We're doing wafer level tests and burn-in. And also we're able to move really quickly because we're testing at the wafer levels. When we try new designs, we, we manufacture them and we just test them at the wafer level. We don't have to singulate dye, uh, you know, coat the facets and then package them into a subassembly and then test them. We're able to test at the wafer level or, you know, or at least many, many parameters of a chip we're able to test at the wafer level, feed that back to the designers and then move quickly into a next, next iteration. So that allows us really to move very quickly. I talked about the SOAs and lasers on chip. SOAs are really key because we're able to get high output power out of the chip. And uh, you know, Mobile Eye talked about uh, uh, using the, these FMCW lidars for their 22, 2025 high volume deployments. I mentioned the two million points per second. And really, one of the, the key things is that we can actually have 184 vertical lines out of that chip, and then scan across uh, one uh, or the horizontal um, field of view. So you know, quite quite excited about about this. It's still a, a you know couple of years away from really high volume manufacturing, but uh, um, uh, in January, basically, Mobileye discussed some of these uh, initial uh, results and uh, we're looking forward for, to the next uh, couple of years and for LiDAR really to become widely adopted high volume because it, it is really essential for, for autonomous driving. Um, and I didn't have time to go into to some of those uh, reasons why it is, but uh, I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Jose. Thanks a lot, Robert. No, it's me now. <laughs> the one that gave you the time a lot. <laughs> no, thanks a lot for, for your uh, presentation. I know that now you saved a bit one slide that you didn't add the what can you do for them? What can they do for you? So what can you do for them? We heard it. Do you have something on your wish list that is coming out to improve, for example, on the last point to go on volume production? Is there something that here someone in the room can help you with? I mean, Intel is, is good in value production, eh? I know. But uh, <laughs> what is it that they, you, maybe one wish that someone here of the 138 people yeah. and I don't know how many, 90 on YouTube <laughs> can help you with? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, obviously it, this is a leading edge, right? So we always, uh, you know, looking to work with the leading edge partners for certain, uh, um, you know, subcomponents, right? I'm I'm working more on the on the on the chip side, but obviously I'm happy to connect uh, anyone with sort of more the the module integration side. Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, things, obviously, that or there are several things that we cannot do uh, in house uh, or, or prefer not to do in house. I think the other thing is also um, looking at uh, other markets. I think we're pretty well uh, covered in terms of the automotive space, and uh, it's very clear where that is headed. But I think there's a lot of other applications for uh, potential applications for LiDAR that can take advantage of really the, the small size, the low power consumption, the high uh, resolution, 
um, that we're able to achieve here. And, you know, so that I think it'll be also interesting to see if uh, people see have ideas on, you know, where else uh, could that be applicable. Very good. That's very interesting uh, to for questions also later on. But now I see people are raising hand like crazy. So we start with uh, Simon from MKS Ophir. You have a question, I know. Hi, hi. Thank you, Francesca. <laughs> Hello, Robert. My question would be, so uh, what exactly would are you actually testing on the wafer level and how fast the test requirements are? Yeah, so I think the, the wafer level testing is something we're keeping a pretty close to our chest, right? I mean, we're, we're able to really, the, the nice thing is that because we have the lasers uh, on chip, right, we're able to really probe it and light up the lasers. And then we have also photo detectors integrated, obviously, on the chip. So we're able to kind of almost do like a self-test um, uh, on the chip, or we are able to, to get light out. Uh, and then also, you know, get it into photo detectors we have on chip. So we do, you know, pretty much full parametric testing uh, at, at the wafer level. And yeah, obviously throughput time uh, is, is important, but, but again, because we're testing, you know, the whole wafer, um, you know, you, you can actually test uh, quite a lot of things, but Thank we're you. always looking at uh, improving test yeah, time. So if you will have any uh, uh, needs, uh, we also offer quite some interesting solutions in this part. Uh, so I think later on, I will have my 60 second speech to do this. Of course. of course, yeah, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah. Very good. Then let's uh, first give this, the, the word to Duke from AMS. Thanks a lot. Um, so I have several questions. Um, yeah. I'm aware that the, the key challenge for OPA FMCW is a 2D scan. And I know that Intel is scanning the vertical line. And how do you achieve the vertical field of view and resolution? Yeah, so we do a we do a one one D scan, and then we we basically have a whole bunch of emitters in in the in the vertical direction, yeah, that are coming out. So yeah. you have a multi layer of wave guys. Okay, got it. Um, yeah. and for the silos issue of the OPA, um, what is the pitch you need for, uh, between the wave guys? Yeah. yeah, so we're not um, actually we're not using an optical phased array for uh, for this product, right? I mean, we we have worked on uh, optical phased arrays, and we have you know, published some results and. I think it's a promising technology, but um, we, we we don't think it's, uh, it's 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 quite there yet from a from a performance and uh, from a performance perspective. So we're not using um, um, an OPA for that uh, for the horizontal scan. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. So now we go to Wilfried Zeus Micro Optics. I'm not losing count, but <laughs> hello, Robert. Good to see you. <laughs> hey, Wilfried. Great talk, Robert, thank you. I just wondered, I've seen different wavelengths in LiDAR and then in PIC, the preferred wavelengths in PIC, I think is 1310, sometimes 1550. So how does this work here? So what is the best wavelengths in terms of sensitivity, beam shaping optics and, and, and sources and detection when you combine PIC and LiDAR? What, what, is, right. your, what is your wish list? That's what it is this way, besides what yeah, you guys yeah. really do. That's great, great question. Yeah, I don't think actually we have disclosed what the wavelength is that we're using uh, on that chip. I, th I think the um, the nice thing about our uh, about the SOA technology is that we can do whatever wavelength, right? And so traditionally, people have used uh, for, for 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 lidar. Often we see people using fifteen fifty because that's where they can put an erbium dome fiber amplifier after the the output and boost mm -hmm. the output power. Um, with the with the uh, SOAs that we have here, we can use uh, pretty much any any wavelength, right? Um, yes. So you can use uh, you know 12, 1300. You could use 1400, 1500. Um, so you, you know I, I think you have you have sort of a, a range of wavelength that is that is quite suitable for that. Um, and you obviously need to look at some of these trade offs that that you get, um, you know, because of atmospheric conditions and so on. So. Uh, but again, the, the nice thing about this platform is that uh, it is flexible and it can operate at, at many different okay. uh, wavelengths. Thanks. Sure. Now it's time for Michael for Ligentech. Michael, Michael. Still yeah. now. Uh, yes, I had to unmute you. Uh, <laughs> thanks, good. Robert, for the for the nice talk and and uh, great to see the 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 progress of of uh, co-integrating PIX uh, and especially these these lasers. Um, I, I have a question for the for the power levels, which is related to to silicon. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we are uh, the the silicon. Usually, I had in mind that uh, there is a two photon absorption uh, if you go to higher power levels, uh, which is one of the reasons why why people are also using uh, silicon nitrides as as there is no uh, two photon absorption. Uh, that is that is one question, and the other is um, uh, the, the the gain that you showed and the power levels. That also means that you have. Um, you have several several lasers on on your uh, on your chip uh, to get uh, several in several channels um, hundreds of uh, of milliwatts. Uh, is there any if one of those laser breaks, what uh, what happens then? Right. Yeah. So um, you know, two questions. I, I think the, on the first one on the two photon absorption. So what we see is that uh, you know the hundred milliwatt uh, in the waveguide is uh, is kind of pushing. Uh, it's kind of the the high end of where, where we're comfortable with. If you go much beyond that, that's kind of when you start to see the two photon absorption and becomes uh, kind of limiting. It limits uh, your output power. Uh, but up up to that level, you know, with our design, we're we're quite quite comfortable with um, uh, with, with the levels, and you're not uh, wasting uh, energy into uh, two photon absorption. In terms of the uh, you know multiple uh, emitters, yeah, indeed. I mean, you um, the, the, I think there's several. You know constraints on, on on the design of of, of your chip, uh, and one of them is obviously uh, around reliability. So again, it helps to have all the reliability data that we have gathered over uh, over millions and uh, millions of lasers to understand really um, what the what the mean time to failure is for those lasers, what what your fit rates are, and design the the chip accordingly uh, to 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 operate uh, within the the constraints of your system. Um, and the other point is obviously the thermal budget. You also have to carefully manage your, your thermal power dissipation and uh, uh, watch out for that, right? So, um, you know, so it, it's just one of the constraints you, you have to design around. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure, Mike. So Michael, do you want to mention the expertise of Tech now or uh, just a couple of words just uh, to just, remind just, us? <laughs> yeah, just, just a couple of words. So um, at uh, Leigentech, we, we uh, provide low loss uh, silicon nitride photonic integrated circuits um, that, uh, that can ha- handle power levels up to, up to several watts. So, so you can put, uh, for example, 10 watt of, uh, of power su- through such a, uh, photonic integrated circuits at uh, at very low propagation losses and uh, and also working with uh, the scalability of uh, of uh, of CMOS integration. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah. So now we, we covered. In case someone doesn't know Legend Tech, <laughs> Thanks, thank you. Thanks a lot. Now there is Martin from EVG, right? There was a question. Yes. There you go. <laughs> Hello. So uh, my question would be, uh, when you're looking for silicon photonics for lighters, how about the wafer level packaging in that case? Uh, mm-hmm. To my understanding, it's a big challenge for data centers, but there are also different size constraints. Would you see here for lighter uh, other opportunities? Yeah, so uh, obviously packaging is, is, a, is a key part. Uh, it's, um, and we've talked a lot about it actually for our data center products, how this, you know, the, the packaging is, is, is very important. It's, it's equally important uh, for, uh, for LiDAR as well. You know, how you, how you take the photonic chip, how you um, combine it, if you will, or, or co-package it with electronics, where you put the electronics uh, um, mm-hmm. and um, what you do at the wafer level, what you do at sort of a, a discrete level. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's an absolutely uh, critical area um, and it, you have to really do a co-design uh, early on with your electronics and, um, and, and your photonics. Right? Would it make sense to add next to the electronics also micro-optics? Yeah, possibly, possibly, right? So I think, uh, that, again, it's, it's, it's all part of, part of the assembly and the more you can uh, reduce uh, you know, semi-manual processes, and the more you can move to a wafer level um, assembly using wafer level optics uh, included, uh, the better, not just from a cost perspective, but I think also from a reliability and scalability mm-hmm. perspective. Uh, yeah, so it's absolutely something that uh, uh, we're, we're interested in. <laughs> interested That's great. In. Yeah, maybe let's discuss on that later. Thank you. Thank you.
So now we have to give a voice to the otherwise muted YouTube. So now I give the word to Jose that we give finally the voice to, to the channel. <laughs> lots of questions for you, Robert, but no surprise. Lots of questions. The first one is coming from one of our French manufacturers of lasers for LiDAR, Lumivert. Uh, Olivier Dubreuil has a question for you. He wonders, are 100 milliwatt too weak for automotive FNCW? And what is the total expected power from these kind of devices in the future? Um, I, I think it's 100 milliwatts is, uh, is plenty uh, from, from our point of view. And, and again, the, uh, you can always have multiple emitters, right, that you, that you add. So in the end, it comes down to a, a trade-off between how much power are you spending, how many points per second. Uh, um, and um, yeah, so we're, we're very, very happy with, the, with what we have uh, today. The second question is coming from Optics Balser in Switzerland, one of our key companies in making coatings for any optics. Mm -hmm. And he's wondering, John is wondering, what does the LiDAR module require a folding? Why does the LiDAR module require a folding optic? Can it not emit out directly? Um, you said folding optics? Yes. Mm -hmm. He's wondering, um, why do you need to have a, a special beam shaping to uh, add the output of the laser? Hmm. I'm not, I'm not, not sure I understand the question uh, well, but I, I think what we're, uh, what we're doing is really we, we, uh, we, we, we send out. So, I mean, the light comes from the sil silicon waveguide. We actually have uh, tapers that, uh, that, that incorporate silicon nitride to, to, mm -hmm. to get the she uh, uh, output of the beam into a nice Gaussian beam shape, right? And then you go out into... Uh, I have, uh, a, I have a clarification. So he's wondering yeah. what kind of coatings, uh, what kind of filters would be interesting for you at the end of the laser? Uh -huh. Sorry for that. Okay, got out of the chip. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously some optical components that come after, uh, that come after the, uh, the, the pick, right? So you do need some lenses uh, to, to get you, uh, uh, get you the, the collimated beam that you need to go uh, a few hundreds of meters and then back again. So there's certainly some kind of uh, a bulk optics uh, after the pick as well. So uh, yeah, so you can- The third question is one of, from one for centers bringing thin lithium niobate to silicon photonics. So you are not gonna be surprised about this question. Amir Gadini is wondering, do you use thermal tuning for your phase shifters? If yes, isn't controlling the temperature of the fish and thermal coupling between neighboring components a big challenge? Um, I wouldn't say it's a it's a big uh, challenge. So all the thermal properties, no matter what kind of uh, phase shifters you uh, you use, um, you, you know you have to look at your thermals. You have to look at your crosstalk between channels. Um, so that's part of the normal normal design. So I wouldn't say it's a it's a big challenge. It's just part of the normal uh, design. Uh, and the, the final question is coming from one LiDAR manufacturer, which is also a tier one supplier, Iveo Automotive Systems. Mm -hmm. Daniel Gorke is wondering, could you tell, uh, sorry, Daniel Gorke is wondering, how fast do you sample the FNCW laser light signal to be able to do the 2D FFT to get the Doppler and range beams comparable to the FNCW radar? Right. So yeah. How I, fast I, do you sample? Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, I wouldn't go into details uh, in, in this forum here, but I, I think what, what is important uh, and, and sort of the, the, the real uh, figure of merit is really to get uh, 2 million points per second, right? And really to get uh, velocity and distance with a single measurement, right? So not, not do multiple measurements, but really do a single measurement and with that get the, 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 the range and the velocity. So that, that is kind of the key uh, figure of merit here. Thank you so much, Robert, for this fantastic questionnaire. You know, my friend Gregory from Ficonte has a spectacular question. I want you to ask, Greg. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Robert, hi. How do you do? Um, I guess a lot of what we're looking at is, is sort of moving in the direction of co-packaging. So if you were to compare your work with the co-packaging movement for telecommunications at the moment, where do you see yourself? Or perhaps alternatively, who is copying from whom? Well, I mean, obviously, we're uh, this is a key initiative for us, the co-packaged uh, optics, right? So I can I can talk to you about it for like an hour if Jose lets me next time talk about co-packaged optics, right? Um, I, I obviously I think both they're both pushing the pu pushing the envelope. I think for the for the datacom, it's a little bit uh, more challenging because you have you're talking about uh, 
20 or 40 terabits per second that have to go in and out of the chip. So the high fre frequency, the RF, the 100 gigabits per second uh, this line rates, uh, they, they have their uh, unique challenges as well. The nice thing about um, uh, this technology is that we're you know, much, much slower. Um, and so that, that, that makes a lot of design uh, challenges much, much easier. So you, you do uh, have the diversity of channels effectively, right? Yeah. Say it again. You don't have the diversity of channels effectively, right? Yeah, there don't there are not that many uh, high speed electrical aids that have to go in and out of the chip. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Robert, uh, you know, in Europe, we are actually moving micro optics as a revolution. We see the, the biggest growth of our members in the micro optics domain. One of the key companies that is leading the way is Limo. Simon, what's on your mind? I was wondering what kind of aspect ratio for the divergence your emitters are delivering and uh, in what, uh, yeah, how high the divergence of the emitter is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I, I wouldn't go into specifics here in this forum, but the, the nice thing is about uh, what the platform is that we're able to um, to do a variety of uh, numerical apertures basically on, on the chip, right? So we can come in with quite a, quite low numerical aperture. We can come out with quite high numerical aperture depending on sort of the requirements. So we're, you know, we're, we're tailoring basically our, uh, the tapers and the refractive index of the, the nitride. We can tailor that to, um, to match kind of what we're looking for. Robert, you and me have a lot of things in common. One of them is our love for silicon photonics and also our love for FNCW LiDAR. You're gonna love the next presenter. We are gonna go to one of our stars in the FNCW world. We go to the company Scantinel. First of all, David, congratulations for all the amazing feedback we are getting from all the companies that we introduced to you to do further cooperations. Thank you so much. You make epic what it is. David, tell us what Scantinel is doing. What is, why is raising so much attention? And most important, what can we all do for you to help you being even greater? The floor and the attention of everyone goes to the FNCW LiDAR of Scantinel. Sure, thank you, Jose. Do you hear me first? Loud and clear. Yes, and do you see my screen? Gorilla glass clear. Okay, so the two most important questions these times. Yeah? <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, thank you for having me today. Um, I don't have to say that much after Robert's presentation on FMCW Lighter, actually. So he covered pretty much um, everything about FMCW. I can maybe start talking a little bit about Scantinil. So we, um, we are a spin out of CalSize, uh, founded in 2019, um, and we are based in Ulm, Germany, and we focus on FMCW LiDAR for mobility applications. We uh, have a, a peculiar mix of competencies in laser technology, photonic integration, optics, and, and software. And, and this is, again, uh, our approach to LiDAR um, a set FMCW, so coherent FMCW ranging, and this is how the final product will look like. So our approach uh, to FMCW LiDAR is to use a combination of um, silicon photonics, so photonic integrated chip and optical uh, collimator in what we call an optical enhanced array. So this is how we are providing a solid state scanning uh, that requires low power. And in terms of uh, swap source, we are using a 1550 nanometer indium phosphide uh, swap source with a very narrow line width and high linearity. So this integrated swap source will give a superior um, SNR and, and, and will reach over 300 meter range. As said, we focus on FMCW and we've, we've already uh, seen with Robert how many uh, how many advantages FMCW is bringing. So direct, direct velocity in every pixel. And this is the, the key to detect and predict narrow objects in, in so long range. Uh, we completely rely on silicon photonics and we truly believe that's, um, that's the way uh, to go to high volumes and, and low prices and to scale into uh, really into, into high volumes and to, and to get a fully solid state solution. So we, we all know that price and, and size, um, it's, it's, a, it's a key aspect in this field. So that's, uh, that's why we rely on silicon photonics and we think that's, that's, that's the future for LiDAR. 
Um, and then, as, as also Robert was pointing out, we also believe that two megapixels per second is something we can easily reach. And our approach is also to parallelize multiple FMCW channels to achieve this uh, megapixel per second data rate. We have announced um, earlier in February uh, that we have already out of the fab our first um, silicon photonic chip. And this is what we will integrate in, in our first uh, prototype um, scanner by the end of this year. So that will be a fully solid state um, based on silicon photonics. Um, and, and that will, of course, not reach um, the final specification, but it's already a, um, a first step into, into our solid state of MCW LiDAR. We truly believe that um, collaboration is essential. We are collaborating already with a lot of partners um, at APIC. So we are working with SIS, IMAC and FIX on different areas in our development. But coming to the EPIC question, uh, we are also looking for uh, collaborations uh, for proof of concept projects um, in, in different areas. Or on a more technical side, we are looking for collaboration for low power switches uh, at 15, 15 nanometers and phase shifters with small footprint. Uh, Siemens compatible technologies uh, is a requirement. We are looking also for improved efficiency of the grating out couplers um, and integration of semi semiconductor optical amplifiers. So this is also a key step as Robert was mentioning and also the integration of isolators. So cool packaging um, is, is also from our point of view, um, a key aspect in, in our roadmap. So thank you and, and I'm open to answer your question. You know, I can't thank you enough when you keep saying we built a supply chain out of Epic members. And I love, I love that this is a part of the success story that you are becoming and how many companies are actually knocking on your door because of what you have achieved in the FNCW LiDAR. We have a lot of questions in the room. We already have the Epic question answer. I will come to you, but first I would like to go to Elbit Systems. Thank you very much for being in the, in the room today. Asaf, what's on your mind? Hi. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask uh, about the scanning. Uh, you mentioned this OEA. Can you elaborate a little bit? Yeah, it's, thank it's, you. yeah. thank you for the question. Uh, that's a combination of um, a collimator optics and silicon photonics. So um, it's, uh, it's, of course, uh, I cannot give you too much details, but it's um, it's a solid state in, in, in terms that we don't have any moving parts. And it, it, it's achieved basically taking the, um, the best out of silicon photonics and, and optics. And if you combine this, the two things, you, you can get a solid state um, scanning. Davide, as you know, Elbit is one of the giants in security and defense. Uh, they are very engaged with Epic. Actually, they are an Epic member. Uh, of course, I'm not gonna ask him what's his interest, but definitely it is great, Asaf, that you are in the room. Uh, I would like to go now, Davide, to some of your future partners. We're gonna go first to SUS Microoptics, the key company that we have leading the microoptics revolution in Europe. Wilfred, thank you so much for joining today. What's on your mind? I just wondered, you said you look for, um special micro optics or special optics for the grading couplers, if I understood correctly in your list of, of, of requirements. So we make, we, we use, uh, we make special micro optics for these applications. And, uh, and we also can take your field data and we can design based on your field data, the best optics. So what are your specific requirements um, for, for your application? Yeah. Um... Of course, so we, um, in, in terms of micro optics, we are looking for uh, um, isolators and that's something really um, interesting in our, um, in our development chain. And in terms of um, outcouplers, um, we are at the moment, uh, we are scanning different approaches. So um, we might have a, a additional discussion with the technical team, uh, but there are different options we are now assessing. 
Um, and of course, um, yeah, talking with some someone like you will help us to decide which is the best one to uh, to, to to take on. Okay. Let's keep in touch then. Yes. <laughs> okay. The second question is coming from Thank a city you. called Florian Anin in Austria. This company is EVG, one of the key members in semiconductor equipment from micro optics to silicon photonics packaging. Martin, thank you so much for being with us today. What's on your mind? Hello. Yeah, my question would be for your request for uh, the integration of the SOAs. I was wondering <laughs> what are their requirements and what, what the thinking sounds to me like a heterogeneous integration wave bonding task. Or we envision here something different. We are we are thinking about a flip chip solution. So if um, we are now again uh, taking the the step of um, so integrating indium phosphide on on silicon silicon nitride, mm -hmm. and and so we did this for the laser, and mm -hmm. we think to to do to to do say the same for the SOA as well. So it's more a flip chip technology. Okay, this, you're not considering to bring this to wafer level, if possible. Um, yeah, if possible, of course. That's that's always <laughs> always nice. To, uh, but in in general, uh, I think um, yeah, the hundred milliwatt uh, that were mentioning that were mentioned before, it's um, it's a spec we we also uh, would like to 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 achieve. So mm -hmm. that's. Um, that, that's interesting. Yeah, if you can integrate directly. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. So there, there's some papers out that can share with you the work done on our wafer bonding systems for, for this kind of integration. And maybe this no. could be then of interest for you. Yeah, yeah definitely. No, let's connect. Always happy okay. to make an introduction. One thing here that you have, uh, I love the Santa Claus Christmas list. So you basically talk about uh, low power 1515 nanometer switches. You talk about grating out couplers, integration with SOAs. And then at the end of the list, I guess, because you think you believe in Santa Claus, you talk about integration of isolators. And of course, integrated photonics is the, 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 the golden fruit, but also the unreachable fruit, at least for now. Uh, do you have any ideas in mind on how you, on where in the system you want to integrate the isolator? Um, actually, we are we are open uh, to have them uh, on package or as a micro optics. Um, so, uh, any idea to further integrate it, but um, even on package or in micro optics, that that's fine. That's exactly what I wanted you to answer. So thank you for reading my mind. I also have uh, one more question. We go to Israel. We go to Ophir, one of the companies in metrology and measurements. Uh, Simon, thank you so much for being with us today. What's on your mind? Thank you, Jose. Hello to everybody. Hello, Davide. Uh, I would like to use my 60 second speech to show maybe a few things that would be interesting for you. And also Time is ticking. OK, thank you. So I think uh, uh, exactly for the for the use in the 1,550 uh, 550 nanometer range, we have more and more solutions available. And here you are. You should see my screen now. Crystal clear. Okay. So uh, yeah, Simon is my name, and I would like to show you in one minute what we do at MKS regarding lidar. So Ophir is a brand uh, within the MKS Instruments Light and Motion Division. And Ophir product portfolio consists of all kinds of laser and uh, lab measurement products that can be used in um, R&D, in labs, uh, so in production lines directly. And for LiDAR testing, we offer um, so optical properties test solutions on different levels. So from wafer level uh, to, uh, to the packaging level and to the LiDAR systems. And um, for all kind of uh, measurement that you would like to perform. Does it go for power measurement or uh, uh, energy or power? So either you want to measure the pulse characterization of your uh, nanosecond pulses or anything else on the lidars, on the pixels or laser diodes, or uh, if you, uh, show, sorry, I'm showing all sc your screen here. <laughs> or if you would like to see uh, the far field or near field measurement on beam profiling. So everything what we actually have uh, we can actually offer you. And uh, the final question that we have, the epic questions. Uh, so for us, it would be really interesting to, to get uh, your input about your challenges in measuring. That's one thing. And uh, what we offer, you have seen, and we propose uh, that you can check also with us uh, our customer-made solutions that we can offer and see together. So that's it. I hope it was 60 seconds. It was fantastic. You know, I have my own muted cap. Uh, so uh, 
I, we can discuss offline about the interest for, for measurement, but I want to go now to one of the key companies in Epic that can provide automation for manufacturing, both in passive and active alignment. I want to go to Gunther Volrath from Ifotech. Gunther, thank you so much. He's a friend of mine. Thank you so much, Gunther, for being with us. How can you help? How can you help the integration of SOAs of Scantinel? Gunther, maybe you are muted. Gunther Borrath. Okay, we can't hear Gunther at the moment. I can <laughs> say that iPhotech actually can do flip chip of three fives into cavities facing weight guys on both ends. So the integration is very, very interesting for Scantinel. And what is also very interesting for Scantinel, a company is doing photonic integrated circuits is something that my R&D manager and better friend, Ana Gonzalez, has to share with us. Ana, I'm gonna ask you what I ask everyone. What's on your mind? Thank you very much, Jose, for this introduction, and thank you for giving me one minute to talk about uh, this open call uh, that we just have for, uh, at the JPX Pile Online. So now, for all these companies that want to explore the possibility to introduce or to develop a LiDAR based on photonic integrated circuits, I mean, silicon is great, but if you want mm, the highest density and a lot of different functionalities, you could explore the possibility to, to develop an indium phosphide chip. For, for LiDAR applications. So for this, AJPX uh, Pile Online uh, want to help you, and we just opened a demonstrator call. Uh, you could apply uh, almost during, during all this year until November, uh, and well, we could finance the 50% of the of your project. So please, if you have more questions, you can you, you can uh, just send me an email. Thank you very you much, Jose. What we have here is the, 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 the foundry services of smart photonics and others alike, 50% 50 50 funded for companies with innovative ideas. So it is a huge opportunity. Thank you very much, Anna, for this. And I want to now uh, go to the YouTube channel because there are even more questions for you because you are one of the jewels of Epic, Davide. The first question is coming from CSEN. What is a small footprint for phase shifters small for you? How small do you want the footprint for phase shifters? As small as possible. <laughs> uh, no, I think uh, it's... He's talking in... about the trade-off between size and voltage. Yeah. No, uh, it's in, in the range of, uh, I guess, five by five micrometers, but um, I can check it. Um, um, that's, a, that's already a very good answer, so don't worry. The second question no. is coming from Technical University of Denmark. Professor Hu, uh, what's the advantage and disadvantage of your OEA technology compared to optical phase arrays, OPA's mm. technology for beam scanning? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, as Robert was mentioning, so we also did uh, quite an extensive research on OPAs. So let's start from the drawbacks of OPAs. Uh, what we ended up um, assessing is that the, the technology is not yet there. So it's it's far from being mature enough for a product that will um, end into the market soon. Um, so th that's the, the main uh, disadvantage of OPAs. Uh, of course, um, if the technology uh, will get more mature, uh, we also have some, some good patents on, 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 on a nice OPA approach. Um, the OEA approach uh, does not require um, so it does not require materials that are not uh, CMOS compatible. So the, the main goal is to have something that is solid state um, as the OPA, but it's um, it's already CMOS compatible and can go into mass production soon. And, and then the, the combination with optics uh, gives us um, a lot of flexibility to um, scale the field of view and resolution based on the, the customer needs. Grazie mille, Davide. Let me just remind that the, the Davide came here today with a shopping list, 15, 15 nanometer switches and phase shifters with a multiple print, improved efficiency of grating couplers, integration of SOAs on silicon photonics, and integration of 
isolators in the micro optic side. I would like to say that if you help Scantinel, you help me a little bit. So do your best to find a solution for this. And also now I want to go to the next speaker. When you look at the supply chain today, you see here the LiDAR manufacturers. We have in the room LiDAR Tech, Mimajin, Scantinel, Omnirom, Valeo, Gesayan, the LiDAR manufacturer, Javil. Thank you very much, Simon, for being with us today. Tell us how we can help the LiDAR manufacturing line of Javil being greater than already is. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to my very good friend, Simon from Javil. Thank you very much, Jose. I'm very pleased to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm always liking to bring on a different perspective uh, to those meetings. You the always same question to you, is this uh, something you can see right now? Uh, almost here. Yes, crystal clear, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. So first of all, uh, Jabil is not a, a product company. We always work on behalf of our uh, clients, but we have uh, substantial know-how in, in also LiDAR applications. Uh, the, the first slide kind of addresses the main topic of this uh, meeting here where we see uh, potential for LiDAR applications, which is not only in automotive, it's also in truck bus applications, uh, agriculture, I think was also mentioned in your, in your teaser in the video. Uh, we see applications in defense and aerospace, uh, also in the robotics market, uh, that means industrial robotics, but also uh, healthcare applications with uh, regards to, to robotics. What I'm trying to emphasize on in this uh, brief, very brief talk is that um, you need to understand not only the components that go into a LiDAR, you need to understand how they interact and how you are able to assemble complete functional LiDAR systems, meeting technology, uh, specifications, but also, also cost targets. So what we believe is required for generally automotive and industrial LiDAR solutions is know-how on, on optical design, mechanical design, electrical design. And most of our partners have this in-house, but we uh, offer a, a additional services for that and additional expertise. The same for, for the engineering services. So everything that is designed needs to be at the end manufacturable. It needs to be able to be tested and verified. Um, we put a lot of emphasis on process development to ensure really small form factor uh, and high yield, which uh, goes down to different active and passive alignment uh, methods, but also the choose of, of adhesives and other joining technologies. Test system development is something that I have or later on in, on my wish list. Uh, that would be interesting to, to hear the thoughts of, of Elbit because I saw a few interesting slides already. Uh, then, of course, uh, since LiDAR applications are not in really massive volumes yet, uh, only lower volumes, you have to be uh, able to reflect that, but also with the potential to scale to higher volumes. Quality, of course, is always an issue and always a topic, not only for automotive, but also for other applications. Uh, you need a partner that is able to provide sustaining support later in mass production worldwide. So not only uh, in, in the country where you reside, uh, you have to have a, uh, the necessary infrastructure. And of course, you need to have access to a supply chain and Jabil with uh, more than 27,000 supply chain partners is very well set to address that, uh, that topic. Okay. I, I already mentioned that uh, engineering is one part. Uh, so you need to have uh, capabilities on the engineering part. Uh, Jabil offers uh, access to these capabilities and it's proven for more than 15 years to bring such solutions into mass production. And this being said, manufacturing production is, uh, needs to be recognized very early stage. And uh, Jabil also has these capabilities in house, uh, uh, thoroughly assessing product performance obje objectives. You need to work on risks assessments, uh, all the documentation, Everything is uh, really of high importance and sometimes uh, considered at a too late stage. So you need to have um, a partner on site that is already uh, taking care of this at, uh, at early stage of product development and bringing products to market. A few more remarks on the, on the robotics market. We believe that robots will become a major enabler of automation uh, with a large, if not huge uh, economic impact. Uh, the market that we are looking at is uh, in the range of 48 billion for especially uh, AMRs, where we also need to address a lot of issues and challenges, which are not only in the hardware, uh, but also in, in software and uh, different platforms that are currently being developed. 
So that is something you have to have a, an eye on to uh, come up with a, a powerful solution. And of course, that's not only the sensing that is important for such solutions. It's also the, uh, the interconnection uh, cloud capabilities, uh, FATP, so um, final assembly tested packaging. That is something you have to have in mind, uh, even if you are not providing this, but when you uh, plan to sell such modules and sub-assemblies to higher uh, integrating partners. We do have a, a small platform of omnidirectional uh, sensing solutions uh, sensor uh, that is working on a time of flight uh, imager where we uh, capture depth information in a radial format. It provides a really large field of view already, uh, placing it intelligently on a robot. You can have a, 30, a 360 degree surround view. And uh, I also have a video I hope that works now. especially for the sound. No, the sound doesn't work, but do you want me to solve it from our side? Can, can you try? Yes, can you try to, to run it from your? Yes, I, I, I can try. I'm not very good at working under pressure. I know you asked me to be prepared <laughs> just in case, but you know that I also a mess when it comes to these kind of things. Let me see when we have uh, the presentation file. Sorry for this, everyone, but it is a fantastic video that we want all of you to see and try to find ways to collaborate and improve. Let me just one second. I like that everybody's saying, okay, let's see how long Jose takes to solve this issue. Sorry for putting the pressure um, on you now. <laughs> yes, it's coming to you and it's coming to you with the best video and sound that I can actually afford to give you. Jable Optics decided to build this sensor because we had customers coming to us knowing that we had capabilities in the automotive space with LiDAR. And we also had from the consumer space capabilities building 3D sensors. And there was a sort of middle ground for autonomous mobile robots and drones that didn't have the right sensor fit, either too big, too small, not the right distance, etc. And our team decided that it was a really good idea that we could showcase Jables Acum in 3D sensing by building this really novel sensor. This is the first truly omnidirectional sensor based on a time of flight sensor. Over my shoulder, we have a robot that we have mounted our sensor to. And the reason we built this robot was so that we could put the Jable omnidirectional sensor on a simulated autonomous mobile robot. And the reason we did that is now we can drive it around warehouse and material handling facilities and actually test the sensor in the actual environment that it's going to be used. What, what's unique about this sensor is uh, Traditional depth sensors tend to be planar. They tend to look straight out with a vertical field of view and a horizontal field of view. What you look is kind of what you see in a standard 2D camera. What was really interesting about what we've built is that we're now able to see in three dimensions. So we put a 360 degree lens over the top of an image sensor, and in this case, a time of flight image sensor. And so we're actually able, as a sensor sits, be able to capture depth 360 degrees around the sensor, as well as we're able to see vertically 60 degrees. And so instead of having to take the traditional 2D projection cameras and stitch three or four to see 360 degrees, we now set one camera down and we're able to see 360. So it simplifies the number of cameras that you are gonna require as well as the integration of the cameras and then sort of now the depth information that you're pulling in from the field and having to stitch that together as your autonomous mobile robot is moving through, as we said, a warehouse or a, a factory. At the current state, we've just completed building 50 evaluation units and we're open to supplying units to those that are interested. Uh, we're continuing to work on our API and our SDK as well as some of the internal algorithm development we've been doing to tune the sensor, reduce noise, and improve the capabilities for the AMR and drone applications. All right, you're good to, to close that one. 
So All thank right. you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Simon, for a, for a great presentation. It is at the end of the day, what we are looking for is cooperation. So I have to say something. Yabil has been the company in the last year to, to whom I have made most introductions for Epic member. And, and I got fantastic feedback from micro optics with very high aspect ratio to silicon photonics to light sources. Thank you so much, Simon, for being the entry point to the huge semicon manufacturing company that Yabil is. And today talking about LiDAR manufacturing, I have to ask you the Epic question. What can you do for the other 695 members of Epic? And what can the others do for you? I have prepared for that. Thank you. I like Simon always comes prepared. It's my fault about the video, sorry. <laughs> You're very, very kind. So I, I mentioned those, let's say, different factors to, to make a LiDAR solution work. And today uh, I'm addressing the, let's say, test engineering, test system requirements where we feel everything is, is possible at the moment, but still uh, improvements are required. One is for uh, uh, the, the large distance testing, if you uh, think about automotive driving, uh, automotive applications where you have 250, 300 meters of distance range to, uh, to, to cover, that is uh, sometimes challenging uh, within an existing building. Uh, you have different options like uh, foldings of optical beams, optical delay lines that you are implementing. If, if there are uh, partners out there that have other approaches for testing, uh, such as, especially long range lighters, that would be interesting. Of course, we need to handle large dynamic ranges coming out of high power light sources versus a significantly lower uh, detection signal. Uh, then of course, we perform a lot of operational uh, environmental testing like salt spray, uh, fog testing, leakage testing. This is all at the moment very um, time consuming, a lot of effort. And if there are ideas to, to, sh to limit that effort, that would be uh, very useful uh, to work on. And then, of course, we see a lot of uh, uh, um, higher complexity in the interface towards the customer. That means customer holds a lot of know-how uh, themselves in terms of the, uh, the next level system. And that needs to integrate in terms of tests and measurement results and software post-processing going on on customer side. So that's a, a challenge because you sometimes do not have the insight on the customer side on, on how to do that, but you have to provide uh, the specific test and measurement uh, signals. And of course, active alignment, even though we have this capability in house, we are also open and we are utilizing other equipment, active alignment equipment in our manufacturing lines. So uh, don't be shy, uh, also reach out on the active alignment part. Um, we can cooperate on that uh, as well. So that would be kind of a Christmas wish list, as you say. I, I love your Christmas wish list. There is a <laughs> lot of things here to discuss, but for me, it is not clear. I'm picturing your LiDAR system in my head. How, how are the optical delay lines? Are we talking about low loss delay lines on silicon nitrate, for example, or are we thinking about low loss fibers? What, what would be the, 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 the shape of these delay so, so lines? The, um, the, the hope would be that um, potential partners familiar with this topic or reach out afterwards to, to really go into detail on uh, the specific challenges is uh, again, uh, giving an insight into the, the assembly itself. So um, I'm just putting this out here. If there's someone uh, who feels um, encouraged and motivated to talk to us about this, that would be useful. And then we can reveal more data on that. Okay. Yes, um, for many years uh, we have we are really happy with with Casalis, who by the way is also an Epic member on the fantastic work that they are doing on active alignment. And we have in the room many other companies who do active alignment as well. They want to hear from you. Maybe if you could highlight one one challenge, one challenge that we are looking from the active alignment community. You mean from from me? Yes, of course. <laughs> okay. Didn't know uh, you, who you were. Uh, <laughs> to addressing. my best friend, Javil, to Simon. One challenge for the active I'm, alignment. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm frank. At the end, it's a, it's a cost adder, uh, not only on the CapEx side, but also on the uh, adjustment in production side. So uh, people tend to try to avoid uh, active alignment. So uh, on the overall, um, let's say, capabilities of doing active alignment at lower cost is something that is uh, uh, always a driver and of interest. Uh, and also doing this for, for high volume, high reproducible manufacturing is uh, an, an ongoing challenge. So one thing that always, uh, Simon, you keep asking me is bring LiDAR for robotics as a topic. We already did it before Christmas. We loved it. We are going to bring mm -hmm. that topic back, of course. But uh, when we organized that meeting, one company, very interesting company for me, joined Epic. 
Robo Optic System, which is a company providing active alignment for the assembly of integrated optics. And I would like to ask uh, Johan, Johan Lomsek from Robo Optic System. Johan, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, we are talking, it's the third time that appears today in the topic of active alignment for LiDAR assemblies. How do you see this market and how could you help the companies in the room? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jose, to introduce. Um, yes, of course, we, we are a machine manufacturer for, for active alignment. So um, our competency is uh, to build uh, special purpose uh, machines. And um, of course, uh, to build uh, this kind of machines, it's necessary to, to make also some design in advance and uh, do some engineering, to do some testings, um, do some, some process development, how we call it. And uh, yeah, this is what we, what we can offer to the community go together and uh, go uh, go for machines which are let's say where we can where we can be in the first step um, prototyping and in the second step uh, for zero production this is what we what we can on prof professional Sa Simon if you don't yet know Johan you have to know him because first he's a great guy and second I think there is room for cooperation here but Francesca let's find more partners for Javil let's do that what do you take this as a challenge? So you said, Simon, at the beginning, you maybe didn't mention it at the end. So you were mentioning that the software part is usually the challenge is to be then interfacing to the customer one. But at the beginning, you were also saying it's not always easy, depending also on the application to tailor to the software. So we have ERS from Synopsis, Aura, that actually has some ideas, right? <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Francesca. Yes, so uh, let me just quickly share uh, my screen. I hope you can see it now. Yes. Ah, is the wrong one now? <laughs> uh, okay, let me fix that. Yeah, if you swap there, where this is, yes, there you go. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, it is actually always uh, very important to consider what we can do at, at software level to do the design of uh, our integrated photonic circuits in, uh, in uh, well, right now we have seen the, the real necessity of interfacing, not just only the part of integrated photonics, but also the part of the EDA, because many of the uh, actual designs for uh, products, they do have uh, the electronics part and the photonics part. So that's a, a very uh, important integration that is needed. So uh, at Synopsis, we have uh, tackled or addressed that um, challenge by creating the unified electronic and photonic platform. So what does it mean? So for, from the IC designed uh, point of view, you will have a complete uh, cockpit in which you can do all the simulation design that you need for your uh, integrated circuits, including our, the, the, the layout part, the circuit part, which is very important for interfacing with the optoelectronic co-simulations with EVA, and as well, all the simulations that you need at device level to, to assess what components you are creating. And of course, very important is the physical verification part. So this uh, complete platform will allow you in uh, many of the application fields, including of course, sensing and LiDAR, generating integrated circuits, which are interface with your EVA tools, and that can be uh, easily verificated afterwards. So yeah, any any kind of um, application which uh, will use uh, integrated circuits in EDA world is a very it's a very good option to have a seamlessly integrated platform that will cover both worlds and very importantly the optoelectronic simulation part. Very good. Thanks a lot, Aura. So now yes, we have yes, also yes. a question from Wilfried, right? from uh, this micro optics. Hello, Simon. Very good talk. I liked that video. It was really good. Uh, I just wondered how, how will it be in general? How do you see it? How will the, because you found a custom solution between these two extremes um, for the robotics market. How do you see that with, with similar activities that we already see in consumer 
systems like Sony and Lumentum, they make all these LiDAR applications for, for, for the eye devices. Uh, there are similar things probably for, for the other uh, consumer systems. How do you see this transition going? Will there be, uh, because we saw a lot of industrial and automotive players, but how do you see the consumer entering into this market, how do consumer manufacturers? And that's, I think, a very, very good question. Uh, thank you, Wilfried. Um, I, I cannot mention or give an answer related to specific company names and on their strategy. Um, my, my feeling is that there are companies out there that are going and moving up the value chain to offer higher integrated solutions, and they, they rely on partners that are capable of, of designing and uh, pro producing those. Uh, some only do the advertisement on the higher level uh, system, but only sell components. And they have no, no strategy and no ambition to, to move up the value chain. Uh, so that really differs from company to company. And you have to, everyone has its own, let's say, logic to follow. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. But so this is also a bit the, the question that I had also in mind. So we heard before also, I guess, from Robert, that uh, the, the question is a bit also on extending the application of LiDAR. So you clearly stated, Simon, that the robotic, the logistic application also in the video, more about the drone. So can you maybe comment on also what is the feeling of other field of, uh, of application? Because as we said, we heard robotics, we heard consumer electronics also from Wilfried, but uh, you were mentioning at the beginning, especially from the um, from the um, agricultural application. So do you have something like a, a, a benchmarking idea of uh, maybe a period of time when we will expect this really being booming or do you have some feelings that you can share with us? Um, it's, it's more more feelings uh, other than, uh, let's say, solid information. We see a, a lot of requests like coming in daily to elaborate on this um, for, for LiDAR and different applications and uh, also agriculture is one of those. Um, cost is always a topic, and everyone uh, knows that uh, the automotive LiDAR is uh, cost, cost is right now preventing also for, for higher uh, integration there. So that's always uh, something that uh, needs to be addressed. And we also give our input, we, like with our omnidirectional sensor, we also addressed the, the cost uh, topics. Um, but this is something where we are still on a, on a road, on a roadmap to a final solution. Very good. So that they were a bit more than feelings then. If you have a really, if you have so many requests, it's a really solid statement that you gave us. So thanks a lot for this. And uh, yeah, let's see. So maybe one day, instead of talking about the LiDAR for robotics and automotive, of course, we will talk about only about <laughs> some new sector that is uh, coming up. We will see. But now let's keep still to this agenda of today. So now it's time for laser components, right? So Wilfried, from his new... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love I love Wilfred. You know, Wilfred, what, what is the purpose of this meeting? The purpose of this meeting today is that we all get to know each other. Wilfred is taking the role, the fascinating role as being the closing speaker of the day. And that is something that I want to highlight. It has been so far a fantastic meeting room ready for lots of cooperations. And what I want to tell everyone is that when the last presentation of today finishes, in the chat here, you're going to get a link. You're going to get a link and you, I want to ask everyone to click on that link and to close Zoom. Click on that link that you get in the chat and close Zoom because we are all going to appear with a little bubble in a beautiful map for us to get to know each other better. All I ask you is to try. All I, just if you only have five minutes extra, that's fine. Five minutes is good enough because you cannot imagine how fantastic it is for us to get to know each other better. This is what I dedicate my life to. So just to remind you, after this presentation in the chat, you will get a link. All you have to do is to click on that link and close the Zoom. And then just follow very simple instructions. 30 seconds after, you will appear in a room for us to do virtual networking. Almost as good as if we were in a conference all together with a little pity that I cannot have a beer and a dinner with my best friends who are in the room today. But with this, I would like to give the floor to one of the key companies that we have in Epic that manufacturing photonic components. We go to Munich, we go to laser components, we go to a company that 50% of the products are self-manufactured from optics to lasers. They have done great job in autonomous driving with a new facility in the US, which if I'm not mistaken, opened last, a few months ago. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to laser components. 
Thank you, Tuesday, for the talk. It, yes. it was, it was Photonics West uh, last week. Uh, Photonics West, without the robot or laser components, is not Photonics <laughs> West. I mean, you can virtual or presence. The robot has to be there, right? Right. So everybody is missing the Photonics West show, I agree. <laughs> It's a pity, but I think it's good that you have these conference. We can share some information and updates. So warm welcome to everybody. Thank you. Um, my name is Winfried Rieb, and I'm the head of the active components at Laser Components. And as you can imagine, the active components is an important topic for LiDAR applications. I hope you can see the screen. Gorilla glass clear. OK, perfect. But unfortunately, not the next file. Try the space bar. Normally it works. Keep it simple. Oh, we had the problem already as we tested it. Oh, no, yes. I got it. OK. So <clears throat> LiDAR is a very hot topic, I know. But you probably know LiDAR is not really new. So looking to the history books, you will see that one of the first LiDAR systems was done in 1969 with Apollo 11 mission. They have installed a retroflect on the moon. And then they could measure the distance between the moon and the Earth with a laser. And there you already can see the big advantages of optical systems or optical distance measurement. So you can make a fast measurement. You can make it accurate and non-contact. I have selected three technologies now, even if I know and we have seen there are some more. But uh, these are the, yeah, I would say, the most common everyday life at the moment. <clears throat> so it's a uh, triangulation, phase shift, and uh, time of light. So on the triangulation, it's something you also can do pretty cheap. So you have a light source. And it comes to a surface which makes some movements or not. And then you're getting the reflected signal on a channel back over lens system on a position sensitive detector. And if this surface changes, you get some change in the angle. And finally, you see this change on the PSD. <clears throat> the, the, the components you are usually using is a, depends on the performance you need. Could be any cheap LED or it could be a laser diet. Uh, depends on the surface. It's used different colors, red, green, blue. And on the detector side, you can use a differential diet, so CCDs, CMOS sensors, or position sensitive detector. So the, the benefit of this uh, technology is uh, you can measure yeah, <clears throat> small distances in a micrometer, millimeter range up to a maximum to one meter with a very high accuracy. And uh, because of the small measuring range in combination with detectors, with good resolution, the accuracy could be some 100 nanometers or even possible shorter, better. Uh, triangulation is used for, yeah, I would say for high-end applications, but also for consumer applications. So if you have an automatic vacuum cleaner at home, some of them, they have a kind of triangulation sensor integrated for safe operation. The other technology I want to introduce is phase shift. So the phase shift of the reflected laser beam or the modulation compared to the emitted beam is distance dependent. So this phase shift can be measured and used to determine the distance traveled. And you, if you want to measure it exactly very precisely, the laser is modulated with a high frequency. So usually we are talking about a 100 megahertz range. But uh, if you need a very high resolution, you also can get up to a gigahertz range. There you can see a typical LiDAR sensor based on uh, phase shift. It's something uh, most of you have already used at home. So you can buy these uh, LiDAR systems on any construction market. They are pretty cheap and depends on the system you have, they measure a few tens of meters or a few hundred meters. And uh, <clears throat> these devices are pretty cheap, as you know. 
That means also the components integrated in these LiDAR systems must be very cheap. So therefore they are using uh, industrial low cost lasers in combination with pin photodiodes for short distance. And if you want to measure long distance, long distance means 100 meter, 200 meter, we have to replace a pin diode by a silicon APD, an example. So let's go to the most common spoiling measurement technique, time of flight. That's something we heard today already a couple of times. So there you can see how it works in principle. So you have a light source going out to the air surface who has to be detected, it gets reflected. And as uh, the light goes the way two times, you have to divide it by two to calculate the, the distance or the, the speed. These uh, technology you can see in, I would say, most all consumer applications. That's something we already have discussed about it. Here you can see some typical consumer applications. So the police is using it for the speed guns. So maybe some people got this feeling already if they get a ticket. Uh, but also for any hunters, they have assembled the lighter system in a binocular or golf player sport people. They're using this kind of lighter technology, even if they don't really know it. The measurement range is uh, from short distance, one meters to many kilometers. The, the issue is, or the tricky one is really, if you want to get resolution or if you want to measure very short distance, uh, then you need a very short pulses. Driven mainly by, by, by automotive, the topic scanner is getting more and more hot here. Yeah? And on the green highlighted field, there you can see what is in principle available, commercially available in moments. And the key difference between these two technologies are scanning and non-scanning. So you can see already the commercial one are most likely scanning. This is a technology It's very well known. It works pretty well for many, many years, also in industrial applications and consumer applications. But that's probably nothing automotive will use in long term because <clears throat> automotive people, they don't really like moving parts in the car. So uh, that's the, um, yeah, we will see what's going on in LiDAR for this business field. Here I picked up uh, a few examples of standard 3D laser scanner technologies for automotive or for industrial. So the, the first one you can see here, that's probably the most popular one. So you have a light source, usually, or at the moment it's mainly a 905 PLD. You have a rotating mirror, and then you bring the light to the far field, getting back, and then it goes to a, yeah, to a detector. Usually it's an APD or an APD airway or silicon PM. But as I mentioned before, many people don't like these spinning mirrors. And one way is to replace the mirror by a yeah, MEMS mirror. It's a semiconductor device. And then people talk about a solid state lighter system. The components are in principle exactly the same, just the mirror is replaced. Then we have the so-called flash lighter. That's something we have heard at the beginning of the meeting already from Valeo. So there are totally different requirements on the components. So you have no rotating devices in the, in the lighter systems. So you're doing a one flash and you have to illuminate the, any field of view with a lot of power. And the reflected signal has to focus to a detector system, which must be very sensitive because there's not so much light coming back. So you have totally different requirements on the components.
So what's it, what is the message of this presentation? So the, the message is, at the end, there is not a perfect LiDAR system available. So depending what you want to do or what you have to do, how much it could be, you, you have to find the right LiDAR system, which is the best option or the best solution for, for your requirements. And even if you have found the, the, the technology or the LiDAR system you want to do, Unfortunately, there's also not a perfect emitter and not a perfect detector. So you see there are challenges all the time. So that was from my side, a very short overview. So I'm open for any questions. And, Thank um, you so much, Winfred, for this presentation. We really wanted for you to give us a little bit of an overview of what is the status and what the need for new components coming to the LiDAR segment. So I'm going to ask you, uh, here we have 695 members. We actually have more than 100 people in the room, 100 people watching on YouTube live, people we're going to watch later. The question here is, what can they do for you? What could you do for them? OK, Joseph, as you know, we are component supplier. For us, it's very important to have the right components uh, just in time. So um, you have seen, I picked up the three technologies which are very uh, popular now at the moment. So I think for these technologies, we have good components. We, we are trying to improve the components. But of course, we also see that a lot of movement in LiDAR development uh, for the existing systems. And if they want to improve it, they also have to improve the components. But the components, uh, they are usually they are key components. So the, the performance of the complete LiDAR systems really often depends on the detector and the emitter you integrate in the system. So for us, it's very important that the audience give us input uh, what they need at the moment, and especially what they think they will need in the future. Thank because you, thank you very of, much, Winfred, yeah. for this. Uh, if you are looking for many different components, they, they, they are great. They really are a great company. And I love I love to see you and your colleagues at Photonics West. It's a pity that Photonics West happened online. But no, what I want to say now is that I actually, I'm very happy with the Santa Claus Christmas list presented today. So I want to summarize it. First, Valeo is looking for big size beam shaping and receiver optics. Intel is looking for new technologies and approaches for integrating LiDAR. Anything, they love FNCW, but any Anything. They, thank you so much, Robert, for being always scouting technologies in the members. Scantinel was looking for low power 15 15 nanometer switches and phase shifters, improving efficiency, secreting couplers, integration with SOAs, and integration of isolators. And Javel is looking for delay lines, beam steering, handling of large dynamic ranges, testing a new active alignment approaches. Please, please try to help these companies. What I would like to say now is that you're going to get in a second, in a minute, you're going to get a link which you have to click. So we all go to the go in the room and we try to get to know each other and we do business, please try this. You will definitely not be not be regretting it. And what I also would like to say is that thanks to Francesca, who managed to put 200 companies in for two hours looking for business today. Thank you so much, Francesca. We now say the meeting is over. It's not over. Now we go to wonder me, but most important, to follow up. The most important of every meeting is that you actually share what you need others to do for you and what you can do for others. The topics for the online technology meetings are already in the website, but please mark the one on Wednesday on free form optics and the one next week on Friday on quantum technologies for immobility. On behalf of our amazing team of wonderful people from medical specialists, dirty photonic specialists, laser technology specialists, optic specialists, an innovation, man innovation manager from Italy who loves pasta and loves me, and a great team on marketing and communication led by Carlos Lisi of Epic. I would like to wish you, wish you that you wear a mask and wash your hands because I can't wait to start traveling again. Until the next time we see each other, take care of each other. Bye-bye.